Okay, it's uh, five o'clock on my clock, so um, why don't we start the second half? Okay, great. Wonderful. So I want to now go to monk rules, which is the the main point of uh, of this paper with Tom. So, um, well, so let's first re review for the Schubert case how, how how I want to think of them. So, in the Schubert case, I have my polynomial ring. Um, and it has a basis, a special basis, which we want to focus on, which is these Schubert polynomials. And now this uh, polynomial ring has favorite generators also. So these x1, x2 generate um, the, the polynomial ring. So just from that perspective, you have a desire to compute, you feel like you'll understand your ring if you compute the generator times the favorite basis element and re-expand it in terms of your favorite basis. So, so, so whatever you feel like your favorite generators are and your favorite basis, you, you want to compute this. And that's the, the point of view I wanna take for the McDonald case. Um, is that and now I'm working with Laurent polynomials, X and inverse. And I have my favorite basis, which is this basis of electronic McDonald polynomials. And of course, if I think about this ring, then x1, x2, up to xn, and x1 inverse, x2 inverse, up to xn inverse, they might be my favorite generators. So the question then is, can you compute xj times e mu and xj inverse times e mu um, and get re-expand in terms of your favorite basis. And so that's the way we took it. Now, of course, there are several choice, different people may have different choices of gen favorite generators. So another favorite choice in, in, the, in this classical setting is to take the, Schubert polynomial corresponding to a simple reflection, you could use that set of generators and compute. And the same is true in McDonald polynomial theory is that there are other possible choices um, for favorite generators, uh, like you can take the E epsilon J's times E mu and the E minus epsilon J's times the E mu. Um, and in the paper, we did several cases of choices of generators. But for today, for the talk, I'm just going to do one. Uh, to, and the idea is the same for all the all the natural choices that we chose. Uh, but somebody else may have other natural choices. I don't know. OK. So how do we do this? So I want to go back to those operators. So x, j be the operator. on polynomials given by multiplication by xj. So I want to really think of this operator that when I act on a polynomial, what it returns for me is just little xj times that original polynomial. And then the theorem is that we prove 
is that this operator acting on polynomials, I can rewrite that operator in terms of things. So I should have copied, let, let me go back here um, and copy the action of my favorite operators. So we've got that on the screen. So, so these are the the things that act well on McDonald polynomials. The tau i checks, they act nicely. The tau pi checks, they act nicely. And the y i's, they act nicely. I can track combinatorially the action of these operators on McDonald polynomials. So my job is somehow clear from that perspective is I've got to take this operator, which doesn't act so nicely, and I have to rewrite it in terms of these tau checks. And so that's what we did is we rewrote that. And the answer is you sum over subsets of one through N. And here the condition is that that subset must contain J. So if I'm trying to multiply by X, J, then the subset I choose must contain J. I'll do some examples in a, in a moment. And then there is a factor that's full of tau checks, which I call tau CJ. I'll, we'll, I'm going to walk through, slowly through, through these things once, once I get them written down. Then there's a factor which I call FCJ, which is a function of y's. And an extra factor which depends only on mu and not on j, which is a function of y's. But the philosophical point is that these parts depend on y. And over here, I know how y acts on my uh, McDonald polynomials. And these parts depend on tau. And points one and three over here, they tell me how the taus act on McDonald polynomials. And so once you prove this, um, you get a corollary. which is that xj acting on e mu is equal to the sum over subsets of one through n, such that that subset contains j. And then there's a factor f mu cj, which is a constant. It's going to depend on qt. There's a factor weight mu of C, mu of C. And then there's a factor, um, and then there's E of what I call rote mu of C. So, so this, is, this is my basis element here. Uh, basis element. And these these guys will be functions of Q and T. And so that'll give an expansion of XJ at um, um, E mu. All right, so let's copy these because we're gonna have to refer to these. A lot so I can explain the combinatorics. Great, this is getting busy. Let's take this one away. Okay. <clears throat> So, so let me explain how I think about this. We'll, we'll just do an example. 
So I'm going to do n is 11 and j is 7. And so <clears throat> one term in this sum depends on a subset of 1 through 11. So I'm going to choose for my subset um, 2, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 10. And very important is going to be the complement of that subset, which in this case is 1, uh, 4. Let's see, is that what I wanted? I better do the same example I had in my notes. Oh, so no. 2, 5, 7, 9, 11, 1, 3, 4, 4, 6, 8, and 11. OK, did I get the complement correct? I think, OK. All right, so, so how do I think about this? So I think about a circle like this, and at the top, uh, this is like a roulette wheel. So there's something that marks where, where the, where you, where you turn over, where you go past. And then I've got mu one. So I'm drawing now a picture of mu, because I'm thinking about the action of x j on e mu. So I'm going to draw a picture, of, and I've got mu three mu. Uh, mu one, mu three mu four, mu six, mu eight, and mu 11. And the other ones are my subsets. So this is mu two, mu five, mu seven, mu nine and mu 10. Okay. So that's the data that I'm starting with. And over here is my, this is, this is my J. So this is mu J in this example. So that's a special point because that's telling me which X J I'm trying to multiply by. All right, <clears throat> so now I want to tell you what this rote mu is, because this is a, the, somehow the first thing when you start doing computations is, OK, how do you classify these, these uh, terms that actually appear in the, in the expansion? And so rote mu is this guy. So this is rote mu of c. And what I do is I draw the same picture again. That's my my uh, first marker. I should have done that dotted. And then I've got mu one as before, mu three, mu four, mu six. Um, mu eight and mu eleven. So the the complement set, this complement set, just stays the same in wrote. wrote. But then these guys that um, are these other spokes of this wheel. So the way I think about it is, I think about these red mu's as the runners, and there's a relay race, right? And so what happens is that the mu2 runs to the next spot before it hands off the baton. The, and then the mu5 runs to the next spot. And then the, the mu to the next player, the, the runners to the next runner. And so what happens is that the mu2 ends up down here. And the mu five ends up over here, and the mu seven ends up over here, and the mu nine just ran one spot only, and the mu ten did so. so the mu ten did something 
interesting because the Mu-10 ran past this uh, the finish line, but kept running all the way to the Mu-2. So, so, so what happens is that when the Mu-10 runs past the finish line, it gets a prize. It gets augmented by what? All right, so so you got these runners that are running, and the one that runs past the this uh, this blue guy, um, the one that runs. Ugh. Ugh, what did it do? How do I get rid of that? down here. The one that runs past this blue guy. Does someone know what I did? I think you did some kind of like, um, um, like focusing in on a little region. So there's probably like a little X at the bottom somewhere to get out of this. Uh, oh, like fantastic. That. You're a genius. Wonderful. Okay. So that, so when you run past that little blue guy, you get the, the augmentation. And that describes which basis elements appear in this um, factor here when you expand. Now, what happens in, uh, in uh, the tau, I need to tell you what tau cj check is. And tau cj check is the complement of c. So it's going to be these guys. Um, and it's the tau, so it's going to be tau six, tau four, and I this tau cj check started at j, so I'm taking tau six, tau four, tau three, tau one, tau three, tau one, tau pi check, because when I go past this starting point, I get a tau pi check. And then tau 11 minus one check and tau eight minus one check. So, so this is the sequence of operators that contribute to this rote. So, so the, the, the way that we got this rote mu, the rotate mu, is that we applied these taus that are appearing up here. And it's this sequence of taus that produces the rote. Okay, so the next weight that I'll tell you about is um, is this FCJ. So in this case, we're looking at FC7 of Y. So that's this factor in this box over here. And that is Y2, Y7 inverse minus Y2. 2y5 inverse. So the 7 and the 5 are this 7, which is my j, and the one that comes before it. And the 2 is the first red one. It's the first one in my sequence. So those, and that, when you convert that fc7j, c7y, you get f mu c7. So this factor in the corollary is going to be q to the mu 7 minus mu 2 minus times t to the v mu 7 minus v mu 2 minus q to the mu five minus mu two, t to the v mu five minus v mu two. So this four down here, and this it tells me how the y's act. And the q's pick up the parts of mu, and the t's pick up this v mu factor. And that's what we're seeing here is that the y's have turned into q with the part of mu and t with v mu factor. So th those conversions are easy. Once you, once you prove the operator formula, which is this top one, 
than getting this FCJ for the bottom one. Okay, now I want to, um, let me copy this row C because there's one more, I'm not gonna tell you all the details, but um, there's one more weight, which I think is really cool. And so I want to tell you that. And there's still time, right? Yeah. So, so this um, extra factor weight mu of C. So that's the, the last factor in the corollary. I want to tell you what that looks like. So that is a product of several several pieces. So it's first piece is t to the minus the number of i's such that mu i is bigger than mu i plus one. So that you can just compute. That's like a descent statistic. Right? Take your composition and just count how many. And then there's a factor that depends on the elements of C. Remember, I have my blue spokes and my red spokes. And so now I'm going to look at the, the red spokes. And I get two. Uh, there are two cases that naturally appear. There's the case where k is not equal to a1. And then there's an extra factor that comes from k equal to a1. This is a k equal to a1 factor. Those are the, a1 is the first, this is mu a1. It's the first red, the first element of that subset C. And this factor, it looks like one minus T over one minus Q to some garbage, T to some garbage. One minus Q to some garbage plus one, T to some garbage plus one. And the, the garbage always looks like this kind of exponents. I'm not gonna write it out because it's not um, instructive. But then there's one more factor, which is the product over the k's not in C. And this one I find really cool. So this one is, is built from factors I call weight C mu Q, weight mu C, C K. So let's think about what is what is a k that's not in C. A k that's not in C is one of the red spokes. So I'm looking at no a k that's not in C is one of the black spokes. So these are for me the um, the spectators. The red spokes are the runners who run around, and then there are the spectators. And what happens is if you're a spectator in one iteration? is that you see a runner running by, right? And that runner has some value because that's mu seven or mu nine or something. And you have some value because you're mu six or mu four, right? And so what happens is there are several cases here, but if that runner running by, let me put it in red so it looks like a runner, I'm gonna call the value of the runner mu k, that's the runner that runs by the spectator at position k. If, if that uh, runner has exactly the same value as you do, then you're blood brothers or something and you say, oh, this is great to see you. I haven't seen you for years. And the whole race stops and everything is zero, right? It busts, uh, you just get a factor of zero. If the runner who runs by is bigger than you, then they just run by. <laughs> you get a factor of one. Right? But if the runner that runs by is smaller than you, well, then they have to pay for that, right? Because you're, you're gonna extract a toll. You're bigger than they are and uh, you can get the toll and the total factor is uh, looks like um, t, so it's got a one minus q to the something t to the something plus one, 
one minus q to the something t to the something minus one divided by one minus q to the something t to the something squared. So, so it's a it's a messy factor, which you can look up in the paper for the exact way to compute it. But somehow I found this this business when we were trying to trying to figure out these weights, and we finally got these runners running past the spectators, then we could actually sort of compute them by hand. And it worked. All right, so I think that's that's what I have to say. Is hopefully it gives you a picture of what these monk rules look like and how we got them, and where we came. Very nice. Um, let's thank the speaker.